Hey everybody, I'm Stuart. We're going to get cozy and I'm going to breeze through 50 slides while I share with you some of my experiences that I've had over the past seven years being a Civi CRM consultant. Up here is a little bit of my background. Um, I have the unique perspective, well maybe not unique, but hopefully valuable perspective, that as a consultant I have seen nonprofits come and go, staff come and go, um, softwares come and go over the last seven years and realized that there was a greater problem and a greater challenge than just choosing which software to use and how to log on and create new pages. And that challenge has to do with the general nonprofit ecosystem and the challenges that we face as part of that ecosystem. We are located here in the middle, Civi CRM as a company, the consultants like myself and you as people who work for nonprofits or people who help nonprofits. And I'd like to start with a not so fictional tale of uh, two clients. Actually, it's one client, but two departments within the same organization. They use the same version of Civi CRM. They use the same consultant. They use their data in the same way. It's not the same exact data, but they have similar data and they use it in similar ways. Yet, one department is struggling, whereas the other is succeeding and reporting that they're very satisfied with Civi CRM, whereas the other one is not. Why? Any ideas? Different people. Everything was virtually identical, except for the people who were involved with using Civi CRM on a daily basis, the people. More specifically, hiring the right people, training the people, making a plan for turnover, which happens inevitably in nonprofits. This is a challenge that a lot of people don't talk about here at a conference where new technology and whiz bang uh, features are generally what people are excited about. But the day-to-day -day drudgery in the office is perhaps the largest challenge that nonprofits face with, with technology. Here's another example. I have a client and uh, didn't hear from him very often, actually, for a while. And suddenly I start getting calls from people at that client that I've not heard from before. I've, I've never met them. And I'm getting complaints that the website isn't working or that we can't use Civi. And uh, they were very vague. And I wasn't sure exactly how to handle it at first. And people are starting to talk about using other CRMs and how they have an Excel file on their desktop. And that seems to work better than Civi. And I ask, where's Janet? She's the person I've always talked to at your organization, and they tell me, oh, she quit. Hmm. This is what happened to my invoices over the next few months. It's the same software, it's the same data, same consultant, but yet suddenly everyone's struggling and everyone hates Civi CRM. And the only thing that changed is that Janet quit. That's it, and my invoices here these are real numbers for an anonymous client. My invoices more than tripled in the coming months, simply because I was having to explain things to the staff that they didn't know, that Janet didn't bother to tell them, and that the management didn't plan for, which is when the best person quits, everyone else scrambles to try and make heads or tails of the system that's been in place and working pretty well for years. So let's forget. <laughs> Yep, well, you know, maybe Janet was, Janet has better opportunities, perhaps. We'll talk about retention plans for your staff later. So let's forget about the nonprofit sector and the technology sector for a minute and where those two intersect. And let's pretend that you owned a nice restaurant or an electronics factory or a hospital or an accounting office. Would you let just about anyone work there who seemed excited to work there? I, I love your company. I want to work here. Oh, really? Great. Welcome aboard. Would you just put them to work with no training and say, hey, we're trying to do some stuff around here and we're going to change the world, so get to it? Nope. But somehow those types of things happen all the time at nonprofits. You're excited to work here? Great. We're so grateful. Why do nonprofits struggle in general? One, money is tight. Nonprofits traditionally do not have a lot of money unless they are part of a wealthy uh, uh, 
fund or trust that's giving them a bunch of money. Turnover is high. We'll talk about that. I've noticed in nonprofits that there's a sense of charity that extends not only to their mission and their constituents, but also to their staff, that everyone's very forgiving of things that normally in other sectors other than nonprofits uh, people wouldn't stand for. So these are the reasons nonprofits struggle, and these are the reasons they struggle with technology specifically. Technology doesn't solve people problems. If your staff hates each other, they're lazy, mentally ill, or corrupt, Softwell will not fix those problems. I'm sorry, that's blunt. I'm, I'm not trying to be antagonistic here. I, I'm really, really trying to help, and I hope that comes across. But some of what I've, and this is the third time I've given this presentation, my feedback is that people see a lot of these things as a, a sort of a revelation that, oh, it actually does matter who we hire, and we actually can't solve disagreements among the personalities in our office with a new piece of software. That those disagreements amongst personalities need to happen in the social realm, not in the technology realm. Software is just a logical machine. It doesn't have the judgment that people have. And, and I've noticed at many nonprofits that there's a, a sort of sense of entitlement, a very good natured one, and, and I believe that I also share this sense of entitlement. I'll tell you about that. But the entitlement goes something like this. We're good people, and therefore, we're doing good work. So getting what we want out of this computer shouldn't be so bleeping hard because we're good people. And I believe that my job shouldn't be so bleeping hard as a consultant because I'm doing good work and all my other friends work for Intel and make more money than me. So we all have that sense of entitlement. You're not alone. I'm not being critical. But you think that because you're doing good work that the computer owes you something. And that's just not how computers think. <laughs> Nonprofits spend money on technology. And are you all familiar with the N10 organization? They did a survey. There's a link here. You can download these slides. If you go to the website, the slides are available right now to download. And you can click through on these links. And the key points are that smaller nonprofits tend to spend more as a percentage on technology. And all organizations spend more on consultants than they do on actual software fees. That's, those are just facts. My takeaway from this, after reading it, and you can make your own takeaway, is that increasing your staff technical capacity will reduce your costs and improve your results, regardless of if you use Civi CRM or another CRM or what kind of website you have. Managing data is hard, regardless of what CRM you have. Or if you don't even have a CRM at all, you just have some Excel files or uh, some file cabinets in the basement. Everyone hates their CRMs sometimes because it's a computer and it doesn't think exactly like we think and it forces us to be organized and sometimes being organized is a pain in the butt. Working on a computer is a necess uh, necessary skill for your staff before they are hired. I'm talking about using email, using Excel, being able to use Microsoft Word. I don't believe that you're in the business of training your staff how to use basic office products. Civi CRM should be a step up from that and a more complicated task, I admit. But they should have a basis of essential computer knowledge already. Using Civi CRM or any other CRM is not the right job for everyone. We need to understand that who you hire matters and how you train them matters. And not everyone is suited to every task on the planet. People inherently don't like change either. So here are some nonprofit staffing realities. In the study that I read, 20% of nonprofits report turnover of staff, meaning people quit, and then they have to hire somebody else, or they're fired. They report this as their biggest human resources challenge, yet 90% of nonprofits have no formal retention plan for their employees at all. And a retention plan means you do this, you get a raise, we want to make sure that you stick around. How can we offer you extra benefits and bonuses? How do we deal with the uh, fact that someone may have gotten an offer someone else? Do we make counter offers? Uh, Fortune 500 companies have not only hiring plans, but retention plans to keep good people. It's a competitive marketplace for quality employees. 17% is the annual nonprofit turnover rate for staff. That means 17% of their staff quit or are fired every year. And that is much higher than the for-profit sector. <coughs> Hiring new staff in nonprofits is the most uh, popular way to deal with a new project or initiative within an organization that is a charity. 
and that has changed in the past. It used to be they rearranged people within the organization to work on a new, new task, and that's good. So let me translate what that just meant. It means that sometimes when you have a new technology project or something important that's coming up, you need to hire a new person to handle that project because your existing staff does not have the skill set to handle it. Questions so far? All right. Only 22% of nonprofits have any recruitment budget. Recruitment means hiring bonuses, a budget to take people out to lunch and dinner, to fly to different parts of the country and set up a booth at a trade fair to attract quality employees. Only 22% of uh, nonprofits have those, even for their EDs. And their most common hiring portal is Craigslist. When they need to advertise for a new employee, they do so on Craigslist most of the time. I went to a user summit last year in September in Washington, D.C. with a bunch of Civi CRM users and the most um, common response to the question of what is your greatest challenge in implementing Civi CRM, I took this on my iPhone, sorry for the low quality, and everyone had little clickers in their hand and they answered C and answer C was user error. So of people who already use Civi CRM or are in the process of converting to Civi CRM, their most common problem is not how do I import this or how do I set up a custom field or the API or the blah de blah de blah. It's somebody screwed up and didn't understand how to use the machine. Training. So here's some real quotes from real clients. Please stop me if you have any questions. I asked all my clients, I'm doing a presentation, would you please tell me how you hire and train people for success and if you don't feel that you've been successful, please tell me why and give me some examples. Here's what I got. A person had a bad experience. They went away on maternity leave. They're a pretty adept user of Civi CRM, and when they came back, the person who uh, was in charge uh, meant well, but didn't know what she was doing. And she tried to import a bunch of stuff into Civi CRM, created 1,500 duplicate records, then panicked and threw away most of them, but not all of the duplicate records, along with the several dozen real contacts with real data that are now trashed. And we cleaned up the mess when she came back from maternity leave. I asked her, what could you have done uh, to uh, prevent this? And she said, well, I could have let you know I was going on maternity leave. I was unaware. She didn't tell me she was going away. She just went away, and I didn't hear from her for a few months until she got back and then told me what had happened. So their consultant was completely unaware of the situation. That's number one. She could have trained someone else. They could have purchased a book or invested and the executive director could have recognized the need for training and expert support and factored it into the annual budget. They had no budget for training whatsoever. Here's another bad experience. Um, a key person quits an organization. In fact, it's the Janet example from earlier. They knew that Janet was leaving. They had three weeks notice. I didn't. No formal training or transition was scheduled. Instead, a director, the supervisor, contacted me directly, <coughs> failed to mention that Janet was leaving, requested a bid for new functionality on the website. They need something new. I responded with that bid. Three weeks passed and a new employee asked me how they can create a web page. The urgent request for new functionality was canceled and that was never built and no training was used. So what could we have done to pre prevent this? We could have scheduled some training. We could have prioritized maintaining your current workflow and systems rather than creating new workflows and new features on the website. And um, we could have hired somebody that was capable of self-identifying solutions rather than needing to call me for help for such a simple question as how do I make a web page? You create page, click, and then you type in some stuff and then you save. And they couldn't figure that out. It was a pretty simple uh, request, but they had also received no training either. Are we depressed yet, or are we slightly amused? Maybe a little bit of both, okay. So here's some, um, here's some tips from clients that reported to me that they felt successful, and based on how often they call me and what they call me about, my perception is that they do a good job of managing their internal problems, and they reach out to me only when absolutely necessary. We'll talk about that later. So again, my perspective here is as a consultant, looking at these organizations, hearing from them a few times a month, maybe, sending them an invoice for the, what I do, providing assistance on request, I'm not in their office, 
So I only get to watch from, it's like kind of watching your, your nephew that you don't see very often, watching them grow. Oh my, things have changed since I was here last time. So you go into a client, you haven't talked to them in a few months, wow, things have changed. Things have either gotten better or they've gotten worse. And this is my perspective. I asked clients who I thought did well, why they did well, and they said that they hire people who are capable of thinking creatively and implementing plan B without freaking out. They understand core data principles and understand why CRMs in general are important. They understand why a CRM is better than just having a bunch of Excel files on your desktop. People who understand how to create accurate data and evaluate their work are important. Here are some other ones. We look for good problem solvers. We look for people who are good at parsing information. And we ask people what their favorite technical tricks are, and if they have a decent answer, great. And if they don't, they're probably not right for the job. So my takeaway here is that people who run organizations that do well with technical concepts, not just Civi CRM, are picky about who they hire. They have standards, and they're willing to let people go and look for someone else. What about training? You can't hire you know, people who know everything, obviously, and your system is different than everyone else's system. And a lot of people don't know Civi CRM, although the amount of people who are familiar with it are increasing in the nonprofit employee marketplace. So people who train their staff provide task lists for their staff. They require their staff to document their own processes. So if they were to be, quit, to be fired or quit on short notice, they would at least have some documentation to give to the next person who fills the chair on why the heck it is the way it is and how they got there. Some organizations require a CIVI manual, and then they ask each of the employees to contribute to the manual. Employers require people to have key competencies for using their website and CIVI CRM and a timeline for establishing those competencies, like they ask their staff to be able to run reports or search and demonstrate that they're able to do those things within a certain time frame, say three weeks or three months or whatever, after that person is hired. Just putting them in the chair and saying, good luck, let me know if you have any problems, is not what this employer is describing. They have a plan. People require uh, some, or they rely on repetition for teaching, and uh, I've had some feedback that Civi doesn't require a lot of training, which is interesting, because I have some clients who say that it's awful and they have a hard time learning it, but yet it's the same software. So what is different at this nonprofit as opposed to this nonprofit? If one of them says it's easy and doesn't require training, and the other one complains that it's really hard and they're having trouble learning it. The difference is the people. Successful nonprofits rely on multiple users. They maintain, maintain two experts on Civi CRM at any given time, even if one of them is external. And they, uh, at a staff turnover event, they often revisit that person's particular roles and procedures to see if there's something that they could do better. Now that that person is leaving, maybe things have changed and they can reevaluate. All right, so here are five problems and solutions that I'm going to propose based on my experience and my interviews with nonprofits. Problem number one, organizations in general, not just nonprofits, tend to hire people that are like themselves. I witnessed this at charities that are medically oriented where many or all people in the office have the same medical diagnosis, where if it's a a charity that has to do with law, everyone is a lawyer or paralegal, where you have an open source um, organization that distributes software. Everyone they hire is a developer, even if their role is not to write software. Um, and the list goes on and on. But people tend to relate to people who are, not like the, or who are like themselves, rather than recognizing that a different job requires a different personality and skill set. And I think the solution is to hire the best person for the job, even if they're not exactly like you. Problem number two. A non-technical person who may be hiring for a technical position doesn't always know the right questions to ask. So the person they might choose to hire is not the right person for the job. So the solution is to hire a consultant to help you interview people and hire the right person. If you can't afford a consultant to do, some, to do hiring, I completely understand. That can be expensive then you need to find a friend who is technical 
to help you select the right person for the job. Even if they're not technical in the particular technology. That's right. It's technologically oriented. Yeah, like let's say your brother works with Oracle databases, okay? And he works for, uh, I don't know, Visa or something, whatever. Have him come in and interview your next database hire. At least he can ask some questions that will help you get the right person in the chair. Three, deciding who does what at your organization based on a stereotype. I'm pleasantly surprised how often typical stereotypes about who would be good at working with a computer are dispelled right in front of my eyes. Gender, age, you name it. I'm very surprised, pleasantly, that if you put different people in the same chair, someone who you might not expect to be really good at Civi CRM seems to get it. And they should continue doing that job. Sometimes people mistake experience for the right experience. Just because you hire someone who's good at fundraising doesn't necessarily mean that they understand Civi CRM or how to use a computer. So make sure that they have the right experience if that's what you're going for. And sometimes you don't need someone with experience if you can teach them. So here's some good signs when you hire people, things to watch for, in my opinion. Look for someone who can recognize patterns in data, on the computer. This has happened before. This is the same error I saw last week. If it's just like, eh, that's not the reaction we're looking for. We're looking for someone who can recognize a pattern and help you understand what's happening or help their colleagues understand what's happening. Two, they have a good attention span. That's hard to come by in this day and age. They're a team player and they're nice. They're smart. Just good old intelligence counts for a lot. They have good judgment. They don't do stupid things and click delete uh, just because they felt like it. They're organized, they're cool-headed, and they're curious, but yet they're cautious. I'm really curious about how this works, but I wanted to ask you something before I do it. That kind of question is awesome. That's a sign that you have somebody who wants to make things better, but also doesn't want to screw things up. <laughs> Here's some things to watch out for. Why are they volunteering? A lot of people volunteer for things just because it might look good on their resume or they're bored. People who are opinionated and do not adapt well, they insist on doing it their way. People who are addicted to Excel and just don't understand why we need a database at all because Excel's always worked poorly for me in the past, so I want to keep using it. <laughs> they're in, they have an inability to self-soothe. That's a psychological term, which means just to be able to calm yourself down without involving everyone else in the office in your current crisis. They're possessive of their thing. They talk more than they listen, and they cannot connect the dots or recognize patterns quickly. And the last one sounds so obvious, but please, if you already have doubts that someone can do the job before you've even hired them, that's a bad sign. Don't hire them. Hire someone who you're confident that they can do the job. You might still be wrong, but your chances are probably higher of being right if you hire someone that you think can actually do the job. Once you have a staff in place, I've noticed that there's always a few people who stand out from the rest and are more proactive and more um, engaged with Civi CRM or whatever technology you're using in your office. And I call those folks naturals. The regulars are the people who, with appropriate training, can do a good job and get things done. People who are slightly negative in your office but can be dealt with are folks that I call tinkers who treat your database like it's some sort of science project and they're always trying to come up with a cool new way to annoy everyone else that they think is really neat but might not be the most practical thing in the world. And disasters are people who are constantly making mistakes and having problems and criticizing the machine. So here's what we do it with them. With regulars, we give them appropriate training uh, and repetitive tasks that they can handle very well. Naturals. You give a membership or <clears throat> mentorship role, and you have them help other people. Tinkerers, you should give them a measured response and listen to what they're saying, but don't let them go overboard. Weigh carefully the cost versus the benefits of any of their ideas that they bring to the table. And uh, read-only access and permissions. There's a very nuanced permission system in Civi CRM, right? You can edit or you can just view and you need to use those buttons to control the last category of people. They're welcome to look at things, but they should not touch. <laughs> Internal training systems involve four 
key components that I tried to draw some similarities and connect the dots between what my successful clients were doing. And all of their training programs have the following things. Involvement, so every person is involved in their documentation and their own training. You don't just hand them a book. They check up on people to make sure that they're actually doing what they should be doing. They hold them accountable. And they place those resources in an available location. So if you have a training document, they put it on everyone's desk. If they have an internal wiki or intranet or whatever, they make that available to all their staff. So have people work on their own documents. Place a natural person in charge of the project. Cross-train people for the same task. Consider actual discipline or consequences for people who fail to do their task or do it inappropriately. I know that could be tough and unpleasant, but it's important. So using the worst Microsoft clip art that I could find, this is, this is my diagram of having a natural, who's your person who's really good at Civi CRM, be in charge of a documentation project, but to get feedback and edit the documentation from the staff themselves. I had a client recently hire someone. Um, I wasn't involved in the hiring process. They hired a, an administrator who's going to work on Civi CRM, and there was a 10-minute phone call, uh, or 10-minute conversation. I wasn't present for it, but uh, someone in the office told me that the person who's new expressed that they were having a lot of trouble working on their computer and that they just weren't comfortable. We listened to their concerns very carefully, Stuart, I was told, and then after continuing and you know, having a very emotive conversation, realized that the person's chair needed to be adjusted and that they were physically uncomfortable using their computer. And it had nothing to do with the database or software at all. I was not part of that hiring process. But I kind of wish I had, had been. That would have been nice. Here's some escalation points um, uh, discussions. I call escalation points moments when you reach for help for someone else, either inside your organization or externally to your consultant. It's different for every organization, and this is what the questions look like. You should ask, you should think about this. Usually when you do something new with your database or your website, that's going to be an escalation point where you want to reach out and you want to ask for help. Here are some available resources for help. We have My Civi Teacher video service. We have two available books, three available books. We have online webinars, forums. There's now a service called Civi 911, um, in-person trainings, which were held yesterday and the day before here. And all of these things are available in the PDF. Those blue words are clickable links. You can download this and get resources for your staff. Whatever works best for you. When you deal with Civi CRM, you're almost always going to need an external consultant or company that you can turn to for help. It's a little bit like having a lawyer. You shouldn't do anything without asking your lawyer, but if you ask your lawyer about everything, you're going to go bankrupt. So you have to be, uh, use your judgment when it's important to reach out to your consultant and when we can do things internally. And that's what um, I talk about, or that's what I mean when I talk about escalation points. I think a good relationship with a consultant is maintained over time rather than switching consultants all the time because that help, they, they build a, a familiarity with your website and with your staff. And if your organization and your consultant are both accountable for your success, uh, rather than we delivered the product, see ya, good luck, I think that that builds a healthier long-term plan for your organization. Ideally, you should have an upward pattern, a spi I call it an upward spiral, of consultancy and internal capacity. At some point in your organization's growth and development as a technical entity that understands how to use Civi CRM and other technologies, you're going to need to transition from, we want to save the world, but there's so much that we don't understand about technology, to a mentality of, we have a pretty good idea of what's going on. And when we don't, we call so and so. And that's going to be the upward spiral that reduces your costs and increases your success with any technology that you have in your office, not just Civi CRM. And also, you're going to spend less on your consultant bill. So here's some realities of general nonprofits. A 17% turnover rate, if you do the math on that, that means that 80% of the people you work with will be gone in five years. 
So 17 times 5 means that 80% of everyone you work with will be gone. And one of those people might be you. So how are you going to plan for your organization to continue to succeed with technology unless you have a training plan in place which is rugged and sustainable and can be passed down from one generation and one person to the next? A consultant, like I was saying in the very beginning of my presentation, a consultant can see, if you maintain a relationship with them for many years, can see the patterns and help guide new staff on why things are the way they are because four years ago your predecessor's predecessor decided to do it this way. And now you're changing and that's okay, but let me help you understand the past so you can make a better plan for the future. The software you currently use today will likely be obsolete, unsupported, or bankrupt. I'm not saying that CiviCRM is going away. What I'm saying is the current version of CiviCRM that you use today, will I guarantee you it will be obsolete in five years. <laughs> You're going to have to upgrade it at some point. Same goes for Drupal and WordPress and whatever, as well as your uh, operating systems on your computers. Those are all going to need to be uh, updated. And if you buy commercial products, the chances that those commercial products will go bankrupt or be purchased by another company that will have different rules and different pricing structures are extremely high. So that's just what you have to deal with. Demand for your organization's mission, statistically speaking, will be the same unless your nonprofit is currently downsizing and planning on going out of business. Demand will be what it is at or higher and your budget will be what it is at or not much higher and your staff will tr probably be the same size. Nonprofits don't generally grow that fast without a huge infusion of cash. So you have to plan for things being pretty much the same in the office in five years as they are right now, but people wanting what you do just as much or even more. Your budget will probably be virtually unchanged. So uh, now I'm going to get into a little bit of leadership and management stuff and step away from training and just, just speak to the kind of successful transitions that I've seen at organizations um, and why some seem to succeed and others seem to struggle. And uh, there's two factors there that I think are really important. One is the leadership of the organization, which starts with the executive director, and the other one is the management, which depending on the size of the organization could be also the executive director, or there could be other people who are in charge of various departments. And it's important to divide these two skills separately because leadership develops a vision and aligns people to accomplish certain tasks, whereas the management asks a lot of questions like how much is this gonna cost, who needs to do this, and they plan and keep people accountable and use the resources effectively. Organizations that succeed have both. Not just a leader who comes in and makes a great speech and then disappears and the management is a disaster. And not just bean counters who don't know where the company is going in the long term. You need both. Organizations that succeed have both. In my experience, having watched seven years of nonprofits get better or get worse. So when you develop a training plan for your staff, you need to be adaptable, it needs to be rugged and sustainable, and you need to remain true to your organization's vision as, and allow yourself to develop a training plan that does stay true to your vision. You need to find the right people for the job and do your best to keep the right people for the job. Here's some tough questions to ask yourself based on my experience watching nonprofits struggle. Is your nonprofit making short-sighted decisions, inflicted with shiny object, object syndrome, which is a technical uh, term for, ooh, that's cool. Do we need it? Meh, but we should try it out. Or are we pandering to quarterly demands of our board of directors that want our numbers to be this, and so we're just scrambling all the time to see what we can accomplish? Is your organization, from a technical perspective or a data perspective, biting off more than you can chew? Are you trying to maintain a huge amount of data that is not particularly useful to you and takes a tremendous amount of resources to keep accurate. Crap data isn't worth anything. So if it's not accurate and up to date, it's not worth having. So I sometimes watch nonprofits say, we want to take the state database and we want to copy it and then we want to keep it on our own and then we want to make sure it's better. And that is awesome. But you better have a team in place that can actually make that happen because if it's not accurate data, it's just going to fall by the wayside. Is your company spending money uh, for technical projects, like pet projects, to accommodate the needs or complaints of a squeaky wheel in your office? 
who might just be quitting soon anyway, or maybe they should be let go because they're not the right person for the job. I've actually sent bills out for a lot of work for people who just couldn't get how to do this, so I had to build this. And that costs companies a lot of money, and I was happy to accommodate that, but those people are now gone. And no one who's left behind gives a crap what I built because they don't need it because they do it the way that it's supposed to be done in the first place. So are you spending a lot of money to accommodate a squeaky wheel? Maybe they could find another position in your company that would better suit them. And with your company, and this goes for technical or other things, <laughs> the question is, would you, spend ten, would you accept a $10,000 gift to put a pear tree in your rose garden? Well, if you have a rose garden, do you want it to stay a rose garden? Or do you want to just do what is available to you and take an opportunity that's not true to your vision? So this goes for technical perspective, like we could spend a bunch of money to do that, but is that gonna actually help us accomplish our vision? Hmm. You decide. And when you're dealing with board of directors, you're dealing with uh, high dollar donors, you're dealing with um, uh, intense management personalities, I just want to share with you a personal philosophy that sharing knowledge, information, and being respectful of those people is the best way for them to also treat you with respect. People who are often really bossy and want it done their way or are demanding are afraid because they don't know what's going on. So if you help them understand what's going on, they'll calm down very rapidly. If you're respectful of their time and you set your expectations of what you want them to do and how you want them to be involved with your organization and how your vision is important to you and if they are aligned with your vision, then you want their help and if they're not aligned with your vision, that's okay, but they don't necessarily need to work with you. I think you're gonna have a much easier time and be treated in turn more respectfully. Be respectful of even your volunteers time and you'll be respected as well. That's it.